a few comments before we get started in worship tonight. How many of you were able to be here in Warrior Fest this weekend? Was that, I think that's most of everybody. I know a lot of you were not able to be. Listen, I just want to say a few things about it. First of all, there were thousands, literally wall to wall. You couldn't get anyone else in here. Thousands and thousands of teenagers that sat on the floor for hours. I was so impressed by so many things. First of all, um, I, when we had the baptism on, on Saturday afternoon, I mean, the baptism went for a, an hour and a half or so. When we got through, we came back in here. There was still over 200 kids still praying on the altars from the afternoon service after the baptism. The evening service started at 6 p.m., and they were still praying until 5.30. They got a 30-minute break and then cranked right back up again and stayed in the altars till midnight. Now, that is hungry for God. I love that, man. I can't tell you how thrilled and fired up I am. I've, I've been running to a lot of tired people. Well, I'm just not one of them. I hate to say that. Now, I did get a nap between then and now. Listen, I am so fired up because of what God has done this weekend, and I am just ready to march forward and go where he wants us to go. Is anybody ready for what God has ready for you? Are you ready? Well, I want to tell you, I'm going to give you a heads up and a bit of a warning. I'm going to, I'm going to need an amen corner tonight, and I'm, and I'm ready to provide it all by myself if I don't get one. So I tell you, I'm ready to pat myself on the back and stomp the floor by myself and say amen when the time comes because I am ready to preach. I am ready to hear what God's instructions are. I'm ready to go after God with all of my heart. How about you tonight? Anybody going with us? Anybody going with us? Now, I, I understand. We've, we've had a full conference, uh, an extensive conference, day and night. Services that lasted the midnight, started the next day. There are a lot of tired people and some that, you know, had to sit this night out, and I know that. But I tell you what, I see a house full of people, and I see a house full of angels, and I see the Spirit of God coming down and meeting us here. It is going to be a powerful night, an awesome night, and it's going to be a transformational night tonight in God's presence. This series is unlike anything I've ever done here before because I believe that God has given me this series as marching orders. I believe these are life instructions for where he is taking us. So if you can't make it to one of these nights when I'm doing this series on God's getting you ready for what he is ready for you, you got to watch it because you can't miss any of the instructions. We're going hard after God. And I can't wait to tell you what the Lord has told me to tell you tonight. So right now we're gonna pray and then we're gonna, we're gonna go into God's presence and worship. And I'm gonna invite as many as want to to come and worship here in the front with us. We've got our group over there with the uh, color and the atmosphere with their flags and uh, they're ready to praise the Lord. We're ready to praise the Lord in here. Father, I just wanna thank you for an incredible weekend. God, I want to thank you. We, I don't know the final result, but I'm guessing that around a 1,000 teenagers got filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit this weekend, Lord. And I'm, I'm praising you for that, Lord. God, I don't know the final result, and maybe heaven only knows how many kids got saved. Lord, we picked up. Our, we picked up razor blades and pills and things from the altars where people came and emptied their pockets and laid them down and you delivered them Lord I want to thank you Lord that we saw deliverance we saw restoration God we baptized so many kids on that afternoon we saw supernatural healings and Lord this place is still reverberating with the glory of God that was here all weekend Lord God, when we walked in the doors tonight, we felt your presence. You were waiting on us to show up. And God, we don't have to invite you tonight because you have already invited us. The residue of glory is still in this room. The reverberation of glory is still in this room. And God, we are ready to encounter you once again. So take us into the Holy of Holies, Lord. Take us into the glory of God and fill our hearts with your presence. And we bless you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. I want to know if there's any worshipers tonight that'd like to come and get in the river of God and worship with us tonight. 
That's kind of how we do it around here. We just kind of walk up to the front and we just give ourselves some room. So however you worship, if you're a crier, go ahead and cry. If, if, you're, if, you're, a, if you're a hand lifter, lift your hands. If you're a dancer, go ahead and dance. But whatever you do, worship the Lord tonight in spirit and in truth. Are you ready to go after God? Let me hear a shout of victory. Yes, let's go after the Lord.
been lifted. Grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting for you. Oh, dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting for you.
thank Jesus that he's faithful. Come on. Open up your mouth. Come on, open up your mouth. Give him praise. Come on, give him worship. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Oh, no matter what it looks like, we trust you. No matter what anybody else says, we trust you. We trust you.
I know you guys are about ready to sing another song, and I want you to sing it, but I just have to be obedient first to the Holy Spirit. I want everyone just to lift your hands right now all over this room. Just lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm just doing what you told me to do. God, I ask you right now to breathe upon your people in the name of Jesus. Lord, you said that you wanted to blow a refreshing wind over them, Lord. You wanted to sing over them. God, you said, Lord, that you wanted to refresh them, rejuvenate them. And God, give them strength and energy. God, let them feel your love, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray right now that you begin to envelop people in this room in your arms. Yes, Lord. Let your wind, let your breath blow over this room in Jesus' name. God, let it be a breath of refreshment. Let it be a breath, oh God, where we're just standing in the presence of God and we feel his energy, we feel his strength and uplifting God. God, there's people that haven't experienced joy in a while. Let the joy return. Others haven't had peace in a while. Let the peace return. Some have not been out of pain in a while. God, let the pain dissipate in Jesus' name. God, I speak new life and refreshment. I speak new energy and refreshing winds of God blowing over those, Lord. God, as you blew on the day of Pentecost, blow upon us now. God, as you breathed upon your people, breathe upon us now, Father. Come on, just receive the gift of God right now. He wants to give you a gift. Lord, we receive it in Jesus' name. We receive it in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, just begin to flow. Just begin to move. Just begin to refresh. God, let tired limbs be, be energized, God. Let tired minds be energized in Jesus' name. Let there, be, let there be a refreshing of the Holy Spirit. Times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Lord. We glorify you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
So come and blow on through. Spirit, move. We're ready for you to come and blow. Father, have mercy. 
bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Can you just bless the Lord right now? We glorify you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, in your presence, there's healing divine. No other power can save, Lord, but thine. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Um, Can you take the next 60 seconds and just love on the Lord for a moment? We bless you, Lord. We glorify you. Come on, sing your own song to him. We bless your name, Lord Jesus. We bless your name, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise your name, O oh God. We praise your name, O oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Make us one, Lord. Unify our hearts. Unify our missions. Unify, God, make us a real community of faith. Lord, a community that is not just holding on, but one that is marching forward. God, a community that is welcoming this last day revival and we are bearers of a torch that will light the flame for the last day revivals lord we are searchers and seekers and we open our arms and our hearts to you lord god we will not stop until we see the glory lord we will not relent until we see the glory of god is hosted in this room and settled among us and our communities are changed and our nation is changed. Oh God, we contend for revival. A revival that is bigger than us. A revival that is bigger than this room and this city and this nation. God, a revival that sweeps this world. We long for it. We look for it. And we have tasted it. <laughs> And because we have tasted it, we will not be satisfied until we see the fullness of your glory. God, we have tasted and seen that you are good. And we want to know the fullness of the measure of your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Make us one that the anointing can drip down from the high priest all the way to the ground. Make us one so that our beards can be soaked with oil and we will speak forth prophetic words. Make us one so that as we walk through this life, a trail of oil follows us from the ones from the Psalm 133 blessing. God, make us one. Only then can we see the fullness of your glory. We bless you. And we praise you. We glorify your name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. If you haven't said hello to your neighbor yet, why don't you take just a moment and greet them. Listen, we're not through. We're, we're going after God all night long, so we're just, we're just cranking up. We're just getting started.
We bless your name, Lord Jesus. We bless your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many of you feel like you're on holy ground tonight? Well, hold that thought because that's the title of my sermon next week, Holy Ground. You don't want to miss that. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord. We bless your name, Lord. We bless your name. Thank you, God, for what, everything that you're doing right now in this moment. We don't have a lot of announcements tonight, but we do have a couple of announcements for you. I think maybe only two, but well, let's go ahead and see what those are before we continue. Hey, OCI. We have had an incredible Warrior Fest weekend, but it's not over yet because Dr. B has an amazing word tonight. He's continuing his series on God's getting you ready Ooh. for what he has ready for you. Oh, that sounds But good. before that, Let's get to your announcements. All right, you guys, Prophetic Summit is right Woo around the corner. Oh, we are getting ready and prepared for that. You want to make sure that you register. Uh, all of you volunteers need to register too. You can register at perrystone.org. Yeah. And we are so excited. Feel free to contact us if you would like to get involved, if you haven't already volunteered. Please. We are still needing volunteers for yes. this conference. So feel free to contact us. That would be yeah. awesome. And also we are going to have a volunteer meeting. Yes, at ISO on the 18th after prayer. That's also another way you can contact us to get involved. So please, you will be so blessed blessed if you are helping us with this. I always leave blessed, so. That's absolutely right. So that volunteer meeting is going to be on the 18th at ISO after prayer. Can't wait to see you then. ISO will be hosting an amazing new teaching yes. conference called the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict Through the Lens of Scripture. This is going to be incredible, you guys. Bill Cloud will be, of course, teaching this because he is incredible. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I, it's going to be on April to the 29th from 9.30 a.m. until 4 p.m. You will not want to miss this. Trust me. It is free to attend in person. But, however, <laughs> if you can't, you can also watch it live stream. There is a $10 live stream fee. I encourage you, please, this, you're not going to want to miss this. I mean, how timely. Yes, it is a really on-time word, and yeah. they're going to be answered questions such as, who really started the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Very important question today. Yeah, so feel free to check it out. It's going to be incredible. See you there. That's all the announcements we have for tonight. Uh, tonight is going to be a very special service. So kids, we're going to go to Kids Church after offering. However, we're actually going to come back in here for altar. So I'm the, parents, you'll be picking up from yeah. uh, the sanctuary for me. I'm excited. It's going to be incredible. Be really good. Now let's get to the word. All right. Well, let me just welcome any guests tonight that might be here for the first time. If we do have uh, first-time guests, can you just slip your hand up and down real quick? Just let us see where you are. Well, we see several of you in the room tonight. Can we welcome all of our first-time guests? Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a phone number here that's on the screen. And if you would be kind enough to text the word hello to that number, uh, no surprises. You're going to get a, a little pop-up screen that says, can we have your email? And that's going to allow us to send you a letter. You know, I don't know about you. I don't trust snail mail as much as I used to. Anybody having those issues? So email seems to get there quicker. And if you can give us your email address, uh, you'll get your letter right away. And that will allow us to have a way of contacting you. And future events that are coming up as well, we'll be happy to invite you to those and just make you a part of everything that God is doing around here. So thank you again for coming. We also have a place that we call the Connect Lounge, which is right outside this door that you entered into. There's a lot of couches over over there it's easy to find and if you don't if you would like to go by there they'll give you a free bottle of water answer some questions and some literature about uh, our our family here at OCI and we'd love for you to be a part of that or at least worship with us I want to just say hello to our online family um, I, I can't tell you we have around 10,000 people every single week that tune in to our services and that's quite amazing really and I get to meet them every time we have a conference. I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, 
I live in Idaho, but you're my pastor. I live in Arkansas, but you're my pastor. I mean, one after another. They were calling me Pastor B, and it was like, one of them told me, they said, there is no spirit-filled church within 100 miles of where I live. There's not one. And so this is my, this is my inlet and my outlet. This is where I go to be refreshed. And they said, when you take communion, I take it with you. And uh, I don't know how they're going to baptize themselves, but we'll figure that out eventually. But, uh, but I just meet, I met so many people. One guy at the very end of the conference, I mean, it was... Uh, we were just, people were leaving, and he just waited in a line and said, Pastor B, can, can I just shake your hand? Will you pray for me? You are my pastor. And he told me where he lived, and he lived out in the Dakotas. And he said, there is no church where I live, but this is my church, and I'm here faithfully every week. So I just want to welcome all of you and tell you we know you're there, and we love the fact that you are there and that you're on this journey with us. Uh, we have just had an incredible weekend of, um, of blessing, and I, I, I just don't even have any words to describe it. I think that at the end of every Warrior Fest, we probably say that was the best one. And uh, so that's what we're saying this time. That's how I'm feeling. And uh, this just felt like the best one. And I hope the next one feels like the best one. But this one just felt like the best one we've ever had. Uh, there was, I, I don't know if there was any way to count, but we had... I would guess a thousand kids that got filled with the Holy Spirit this weekend. Isn't that amazing? Right here in this room. I don't know how many kids that got, uh, that got saved, but I know just from some of the things we picked up off the floor and the altar that a lot of kids got delivered. We picked up some things that shouldn't be, well, they're not legal, and they shouldn't have been in church, but they were here, and thank God they were in the right place. And they didn't leave with them. They left them here, and they walked out with their pockets, their pockets empty. And we had so many people who left here with their hearts empty or hearts full. Um, we had one youth group that flew in from Lithuania, which is next door to Cindy Getchman. And by the way, Cindy, I, I can't have you in service without having you to stand. She doesn't live in the United States. She lives in Romania. And this is a lady. Would you stand, Cindy? I want to honor you because she is one of our missionaries, and she is home on furlough. Cindy has been running a, um, she has been running a, a conference center. When she went there, I was her pastor for many years in St. Louis when the Lord called her to become a missionary. And um, she went and they gave her this old broken down building that no one wanted. And she was this single woman over there and had to figure out how to do all this. She had never been a missionary before. And she started raising funds and turned this old broken down building into an amazing community center. I've actually taken groups there and we've stayed in it. And uh, she started a feeding program in one of the poorest areas of Romania and has done this for years. And the Lord has recently called her into a new field of ministry. So she just, just in the last little while, set, raised up new leaders for this community center. And now she is involved in, in getting young ladies out of sex trafficking. And she is just, what an amazing ministry. I'm telling you, she is one tough girl. She really is. She is one tough lady. And uh, because she does this, she has built a home for them to come and live in when they get off of sex, uh, get out of sex trafficking. And so, you know, Perry has blessed her. We have blessed her. She's one of my missionaries I sponsor every month. And, and I hope that lots of, I hope there's a lot more like me out there because I, I know that you need as many as you can get. But it's such an honor to have you. But we had a youth group that came in from Lithuania, which is your neighbor just practically. I mean, they're right there on the Russian border. And there was a whole youth group that flew in here for Warrior Fest. And I had a youth pastor's meeting before the service for prayer. We did a big prayer before it ever started. And I met the young lady that was with this group, and she was just weeping. She said, we have been saving up. We have been doing everything we could. We flew in here from Lithuania because these young people have nothing and there is, no, there is no spirit in our area. And I want them. She was just crying so hard. She said, I want them to go home on fire. And I'm telling you, I kept my eye on them all weekend. And they went home on fire. Perry had them to come up at the very end and honored them. And um, it was just incredible. I, I can't say enough. I, I can't say enough about the baptism 
We baptized so many on a cold day too. But we baptized for an hour and a half out there. And then after baptism, we came in and there was still 200 kids still praying in the altars. I mean, they didn't want to leave. We saw youth groups transformed. We saw people healed. Miracle after miracle after miracle. I can't say enough. I, I just want to. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Perry and Pam, for letting God birth Warrior Fest in your heart and the voice of evangelism. Thank you for that, and thank you, OCI. You guys served. I watched you, and I'm telling you what, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the father of the house, so I can say this. I'm a proud papa today. I am so happy to, that, that you guys served so well. Our, our altar teams were amazing. I saw people jumping up and down that I've never seen jumping up and down before. I'm, I got my eye on you. I want to see if that was, you know, no. <laughs> I, want to see, I want to see that again. It was amazing. One of the things that we did this Weir Fest we've never done before that I just want to applaud our prayer team and, and, and Michael and April who really led that part of this for you. You guys just did an outstanding job. You really did. Um, but this year, we decided to do something we've never done. We paired up our young people from our youth group, those that are in Awaken. And listen, that, guy, that group Awaken, they, they ministered in every service. I mean, these guys came early, stayed late. They danced their legs off. They shouted till they had no voice. And then they worked the altars. Every night, we paired up a member of Awaken with a member of our prayer team and send them out. Uh, I call that bows and arrows. And if you've read my book, you know what that means. It's, it's, we, it was a training moment. And I tell you guys, there were times all I could do is stand back and weep because I saw young people and, and I saw two generations doing what we're supposed to do. I got to witness Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all at the same time in the house. And they were praying for people, and um, I could just, I mean, uh, I could go on, and I still got to preach, and I want to preach, so, but I could go on and on and on. I have no words to describe what I witnessed this weekend. It was phenomenal in every way, and some of you made that possible. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your tirelessness. We had people cleaning this building in the middle of the night. I mean, we had so much going on that it, it never slept. I mean, there was ministry going on literally around the clock. And the sermons, I can't say enough about the sermons. My goodness. They were just incredible. Every speaker just gave their best every single. We had three worship teams and they all performed every night, and they did an outstanding job. I mean, guys, think about this. We worshiped for two hours before we even put the preacher up there. He preached. He got a good 45 minutes to an hour, and then we prayed in the altars another two hours. When's the last time your teenager wanted to be in a five-hour worship service and couldn't wait to get back the next morning and do it all again? That's the kind of move of God that we saw. That's the kind of move of God. It was amazing, really amazing. So here's what I want to do tonight. I want to designate this as a Thanksgiving offering. I just want to say thank you, Lord. I, I pay my tithes and offerings every week, but I'm going to give, in addition to that, myself. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give in addition to that. Uh, I just want to seed into that moment myself and say, Lord, I, I, I know this is the beginning of something. That's not the end. It's the beginning of something. I want to sow into that next generation. And I just want to sow into what God did at Warrior Fest and what he's getting ready to do at the end of this month in Prophetic Summit. And Bill Cloud's got a conference between now and then. So we have three conferences in this building this month. And uh, also wanted ISO. So what a month. My goodness, what an incredible month to, to be involved in ministry. But tonight as you give in your tithes and offerings, I want you to just ask the Lord, Lord, what do, you, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to sow a gift of thanksgiving and gratitude? Because that's what I feel in my heart. I am so overjoyed with, um, and I'm just so overjoyed with thanksgiving right now. I just want to give something back to the Lord and say thank you for what you've given to me. Just personally, what I, what I personally received. So I'm going to pray over this offering. I'm going to ask our ushers to come. If you like to give on your phone, which is how I always give, you can use the QR code to the left. And you can also text the word OCI to the number on the screens, and it will prompt you how to give that way as well. For those of you that use Planning Center, and you're in our system, if you're one of our volunteers, you, you've got a Planning Center app, 
you can now go into planning center and hit the give button and give right from there. And so I've done that too, and it works just great now. So you can go into your planning center app and just hit give. We've never had that button on there until about uh, three weeks ago. So now you can hit give and give right there from planning center. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Or we also take cash and checks and whatever God gives you to give. Uh, just give from your heart, whatever you give. Can you stand with me all over the room? Father, I just speak a blessing over this offering right now. God, we're bringing you an offering of thanksgiving and gratitude. Lord, there's lots of us are paying tithes and offerings, but God, in addition to that, I know myself, I, my heart is so full, I have to say thank you. So Lord, I just want to give in addition to what I normally give uh, as, a, as a, an overflow from my own life. So I ask you, Lord, now that you'll bless the gift and the giver according to your divine blessings and riches in heaven. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, all right, if you have a gift to bring, bring it. If you want to get out your phone, this is a good time to do that as well. the Lord. I need me a psalmist to write me a good worship chorus on God's getting you ready for what he is ready for you. Um, I'm, I won't go into the full story again, but I need to tell you where this phrase comes from. Uh, many years ago, I told this in the first sermon that I delivered in this series. But many years ago, I um, one of the only times that I've ever spoken to an angel in my life, and I didn't even know it was an angel. You know what? I'll go ahead and tell the story. It, it just fits so well with this whole series. I want you to know how this phrase was birthed for me. My daughter, Brittany, was in Lee uh, University at the time, and my daughter, Lindsay, and Faith and I, were, we were living in St. Louis, and we were coming to visit her. It was in the wintertime, and it had come a big snow, and um, we were traveling very slow on the interstate to come and spend my daughter's birthday with her, which is in March. And so we were coming to visit her for her birthday. And um, we, because it was snowing, we had to drive a little slow. Well, uh, I have girls in the car, right? So they had to make a, more, a few more stops than I did. And so they needed another stop. And so I, the car was full of gas, but I pulled over again for them. And we pulled up to this little convenience store Somewhere in Illinois, I don't even know where we were at, but it was somewhere in Illinois. And um, there was a, a, a lady pulled in beside of me in a car. I can't even really remember what the car looked like because I was so um, fixed on her. And this lady got out. I would guess her age is probably in her early 70s, you know, if I had to guess her age. And this lady got out, and she was walking around in the snow, and she was doing like this. And she was saying, the vision, the vision, the vision, something's wrong with the vision. And I could actually hear her saying that because my, my girls were inside and I was sitting in the car and I just kind of felt sorry for her. And I, and I got out of the car and I said, um, ma'am, can I help you? And she, she didn't answer me normally. She said, the vision, the vision, the vision, something's wrong with the vision. That's what she said. And I said, maybe she needs windshield wiper fluid. That's all I could think of. Maybe her windshield wouldn't clear up and she couldn't see very well. That's all I could think of. I mean, I have no idea what was going on. And so I happened to have that in my, the trunk of my car. So I got out the blue kind, you know, that's the winter kind. And, and I poured it. I popped the hood of her car. And I, there it was. And I popped up the little reservoir. And I poured in the blue stuff. And I got, you know, partial can left over. I popped it down and I closed the lid. And I went back to tell her to turn on your windshield wipers, make sure your wipers are working. Let's get your windshield clean. That's what that was my plan. Before, but before I could say anything, 
when I popped the hood of the car, she walked, she was standing beside of me. She grabbed my hands. And to be honest with you, it, it spooked me just a little bit that she did that because I didn't know why she did it. And she, she grabbed my hands and I looked at her. And when I looked at this woman, I realized that I'd never seen any person look like this at all. It was like her eyes were missing, if I can just say it that way. I looked into her eyes and where her eyeballs should have been, it was like looking at the Caribbean Ocean. It was the blue, it was blue and like sparkling in blue. It was like looking into, uh, looking into the ocean in the Bahamas or someplace like that. It was like that was in her head. And, and, I, and I was so startled and I did not even know what to do. I didn't honestly couldn't think fast enough to know what I was dealing with in the moment. And then all she said was this, God's getting you ready for what he has ready for you. And I said, what? And she said it again. God's getting you ready for what he has ready for you. And I had no idea what she meant. I didn't know. I said, ma'am, can you wait right here? Because, you know, my wife takes a little convincing sometimes, and I want you to tell her this. You know, if I tell her she, she may not get it the way I want her to see your eyes and hear your voice say that. And so I, I turned around in faith, and my daughter Lindsay were coming out of the store. And I thought, this is perfect timing. I said, honey, I want you to come here and meet this lady. And she said, what are you up to, cut y'all? I said, what do you mean? I looked around. There was no woman. There was no car. And I'm standing there holding evidence. I have a half a jug of windshield wiper fluid and no evidence that I ever poured it anywhere. And every, everything is gone. And my wife said the reason she knew that it really was an angel is because I didn't speak for three hours. And that's the first time in my life that it ever happened. But for the, I, I was so stunned by this and absorbing it that when I got in the car, I, I couldn't say anything. I, I, all, all I could do was hear these words, God's getting you ready for what he is ready for you. I've been looking for the promise of that. I've been looking for the fulfillment of that. And this is the first time since that time that the Lord told me to call a series, God's getting you ready for what he is ready for you. And I need to tell you something, OCI. This is not sermons that I'm preaching here for the next several weeks, ever how long it lasts. I think it could be five or six. I don't know. I'm just letting God give it to me. But we're, we're following the story of Joshua. And I believe this is our instructions to go into our promised land. I believe that for this house, I believe that what I'm giving you is God's instructions that says, this is the path forward. And this is how you fulfill all the prophecies over this house, all the promises over your lives. This is the path to do that. So we're on a journey with Joshua. And I gotta tell one quick thing that I'll, you're gonna hear me say this next week. But it was uh, Saturday night in the service and the Spirit of God was moving. Most of the bands had stopped playing and there was just a couple of people up here playing. And I was standing here because I wanted them to know that, you know, the, that they could pray as long as they wanted and that there was order in the house. And so I just kept, I was walking, even though a lot of people were gone, I just walked the, the platform and prayed over them just so everyone would say, would feel like, that gave them permission to stay and pray and seek God. And I just wanted them to know that was okay. So I just kept walking, even though the room was empty. And, and I'm over there, and one of the young ladies that's in, the, and you'll hear me tell this again next week, one of the young ladies who is in Awaken ran over to me, and I'm standing right here behind this pulpit. She says, Dr. B, God gave me a word for you. I said, what is it, darling? He said, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Now, I realize to you that might sound like a song or something simple, but you have no idea what that meant to me because next week, the title of my sermon is Take Off Your Shoes, You're on Holy Ground. I mean, that's what I'm preaching on next week. And uh, I don't know if we're going to kick off our shoes or not, but just be ready. Wash your feet before you get here. I'm just telling you, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but I may have to take off my shoes next week. And uh, but But she... To me, that was the Lord saying, I'm telling you, God's getting you ready for what he has ready for you. You're beginning to see it release now into the atmosphere. You're beginning to see the promises come to pass. So 
Tonight, I'm going to do the second sermon in this series on God's getting you ready for what he has ready for you. And tonight, I want to entitle this, uh, What Do These Stones Mean? What Do These Stones Mean? Um, I, want to, I want to tell you where this picture came from. I actually took this picture on a trip to Israel. I am there at Gilgal, which is where we're going to end up tonight. So I'm at Gilgal, and these are the stones that are in this formation at Gilgal that many people believe to be the possible stones that they took from the Jordan River and they brought them and laid them there as the memorial stones, which is where we're going to go tonight in this sermon. So I want you to know that this photo, and you'll see it again later in an aerial view, this photo is the actual site of Gilgal where the children of Israel would have camped. And this is a potential site where there's 12 stones lined up, a potential place that this could be the actual site of where they laid the 12 stones there at Gilgal. So understand this, the very first place that God takes the children of Israel is a place called Gilgal. And the word Gilgal is interesting because it means a wheel rolling. You know, I could make a good joke here because I tell everybody when Perry walks in the room, I say, you got to watch it because now we're rolling with the stone. That's kind of a phrase I use. You never know what he's going to say. You never know what he's going to do and what idea he has. And I say, just roll with the stone. So what do these stones mean? We're in Gilgal, a place of rolling with the stone. So when you're, when you're hanging out with Perry, you never know what that's going to look like. So I want, to, I want to go to where God first told the children of Israel to camp, and we're going to be in Joshua chapter 5. We're going to start in Joshua chapter 4. You can go ahead and go there in your Bibles, and then we're going to go into Joshua chapter 5 a little bit as well. I want to read one verse. This one's not on the screens for you, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just read this verse as kind of to set everything up for tonight. Joshua 5 and 9 says this. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, this place will be called Gilgal to this day. So it means the rolling away of something, the rolling of a stone. And so this means a place where God rolled away the reproach of Egypt. Now, here's what you need to understand about this story. I have two points And only two points that I have to tell you tonight. The first one is this. Gilgal was the place where two groups had to be identified. The first group is the fathers and the mothers. So that before you can go forward, you have to know who's a witness of what God has already done. So they wanted them to identify the spiritual fathers and mothers. Now, we're not talking about people that have a, 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 a genealogy. We're not talking about people that, have, that physically have given birth. We're talking about people of faith that have seen what God has done and is imparting that to another generation. So there is a difference in being a, a, a parent physically and being a spiritual father and a spiritual mother. So they had to identify first in order to go where they've never been, they had to know what voices to follow so the Lord said identify your spiritual leaders identify your fathers and your mothers and then the second thing they had to do is identify which people in the next generation would take up the sword and become the next army so two things had to be had to be identified the fathers and the mothers and the warriors of the next generation also had to be identified So we're going to pick up our story in Joshua chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. These should be on the screen for you. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, He said, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan. Now, let me bring you to where we landed in the last sermon. The Jordan River has parted. So there, the, the, the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan with the Ark of the Covenant. So now God is telling 12 men to go into the riverbed. There's no water in it. It's completely dry, the Bible says. So not, there's not even any mud or wet sand. God completely dried it up supernaturally. He rolled it all the way back to the city of Adam. How many of you can see a sermon in there? I don't have time to preach that one, but he rolled it back all the way to the city of Adam. 
So now we have this dry riverbed and God tells him to have 12 men to stand where the priest's feet have stood in the middle of the Jordan and carry those stones out and take them to the lodging place where you're gonna lodge tonight. So then Joshua called 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark, your God, into the midst of the Jordan, and each one take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. He, he repeats himself there, says it twice. And these stones shall be as a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Now when the people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, they camped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. This is in verse 19 and 20. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. Okay, so here's where we are. We've taken 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan River, and now he has been instructed by God to set them literally in a circle, a circle of stones, put these stones in a circle there at this place called Gilgal. And then he gives them instructions. He says in this instruction, first of all, when you tell your children they ask you what these stones mean. So the first group he's identifying are people who have children, fathers and mothers. So he wants you to identify, first off, who are the spiritual fathers and mothers who have witnessed this day. I need eyes who saw the waters parted. I need people who were there, as they used to sing an old song in my church, I was there when it happened, and I guess I ought to know. Anybody ever heard that song? They might have only sang that at my church. Maybe somebody wrote it, I don't know. But they used to sing a song, I was there when it happened, and I guess I ought to know. I need people who saw the miracle. I don't need people whose hearts are filled with doubt. I don't need people whose hearts are discouraged. I don't need people who are just hanging on, barely getting by. I need some people full of faith who have seen what God has done. They saw the waters part. They walked through the middle of the miracle. I want you to identify people who can say, I know where we've come from. I know what God has brought us through. I need a group of people who have paid the price, who've stayed the course, who didn't give up the faith, though discouraged, they kept on going. I need a group of people who can be identified. Now notice this, there is a reason why he wants them. He doesn't want people who are just spiritually mature. He's asking for witnesses. Now the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13 and 1 that every matter, every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So the Lord calls for 14 witnesses. I want 12 stones and I want a father and a mother. I want you to put 12 stones here and I want a somebody, I want a man and a woman who can stand in the midst of these stones and when your children ask, what do these stones mean? You will say to them, I was there when the river of Jordan rolled back. I was there when God did it. You can trust me and you can trust these memorial stones because if God brought me from there to here, the same God that brought me from there to here is the same God that can take me from here to there. So God said, I want witnesses. Now, why 14 witnesses? I don't know why. I don't pretend to know the mind of God, but I could guess why 14, because I could tell you that on the 14th day of the month is the day of Passover, and maybe the Lord said, I want to tie this miracle into the day that you left Egypt and, you're, and, and, and you left there with riches when you left slavery into a life of freedom. I want to, ta I want to tag this on. That's the word we'd use today. I want to tag it on to the Passover story and let you know 
that when you leave Egypt, God will make your life full and rich in every way. You can be a slave one day and a landowner the next day when you run with the Lord. So maybe that's why, maybe it's because that seven is the number of completion on the earth and two is the number of the Messiah. Maybe it's because two times seven is 14 and he said Jesus is in this moment. You don't know him yet, but one of these days he'll be born in Bethlehem. He'll die on a cross. He'll raise from the dead and he'll be the savior of the world and I'm putting his stamp and signature on this moment. He completed it in the Old Testament and he completed it in the New Testament. There's the number 14. He he did it for Moses. He'll do it for you. There's the number 14. Maybe 12 stones because 12 is the number of government and it's going to represent in the Old Testament the, the number of the 12 tribes of Israel. But one of these days the master will walk with 12 apostles and there'll be a new government. A government of grace and mercy and peace. A day of deliverance when the, when the Messiah comes to set the captives free and start and call us, call us into a season of jubilee. So he says, I want you to set up 12 memorial stones. I think we have another picture of this that I want to show you. It is the aerial view of the same picture. You can see these 12 memorial stones there. He said, these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. 12 witnesses, witnesses of the origin, witnesses of the miracle, witnesses of the victory, witnesses that, yes, we came through the desert, but we have overcome. Witnesses that, yes, some of them died along the way, but we're still here. Yes, witnesses in the wilderness that God provided. God spread a table in the desert like no one else could. We are witnesses. Yes, tell your children, we fought the the Amalekites, but we are still here. Tell your children, King Og of the giants came against us, and Moses led the children and Joshua led the army and the old giant king had to fall because we have fought the giants but guess what we are still here yes tell them the story that we thought we were going to starve to death but the Lord sent quail from the sea and fed us and spread a table in the wilderness they said we would starve but we're still here they said we would thirst to death because there was no well but God told Moses to speak to a rock and water came flowing from the rock and God provided a stream in the desert and we're still here. Tell your children that yes, it's been rough. It's been long. It's been hard. But we just put one foot in front of the other. Tell your children that there were days we didn't think we would get back up, but we got back up. There were days we didn't think we'd see tomorrow, but we saw tomorrow. Tell them that there were days that we didn't think we were going to see the finish line, but here we are all the way in the land of promise. Yes, we have fought battles, but we're still here. And we got hungry, but we're still here. And we got thirsty, but we're still here. And we faced giants, but we're still here. We saw, but when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Why don't you put your own story in there? I came through divorce, but it didn't break me. I am still here. I've come through sickness. The doctor said I wasn't going to make it, but I'm still here. I lost my job. I didn't think there was a future, but guess what? My hands are still in the air. My feet are still dancing. Though I've come through loss, though I've come through mourning, I still got the praises of God on my lips. I'm still shouting glory. Oh, it gets tough, but I'm going to make it. It gets difficult. Oh, yes, I've got a prodigal child, but I'm still here. Yes, I've gone through emotional hell, but I'm still here. Yes, my child's in prison, but I haven't stopped praying. I'm still here. I've come through addiction, but I'm still here. I've come through a court trial, but I'm still here. I've come through financial struggle, but I'm still here. I've come through marital strife, but I'm still here. Disappointed, yes, but I'm still 
here. Grief and loss sometimes, but I'm still here. Heart battles, yes, but I'm still here. Oh, you can just put the OCI story in there. We have come through transition, but we're still here. We have changed our names, but we're still here. We have come through COVID, but we're still here. Hallelujah. We've gone through leadership change, but we're still here. Have we gone through spiritual battles? Oh, yes, we have. But we're still here. Have we lost some good friends along the way? Yes, we have. But we're still here. And Warrior Fest is still here. And Main Event is still here. And Prophetic Summit is still here. And ISO is still here. And VOE is still here. Come through hard times, but here we are, singing the glory and the praises of God. It knocked us down, but we got up again. Put your own story. I am a witness. God made it fail. I'm a witness of what God can do. I'm a witness that it may get tough, but if you keep going, God can see you all the way to the other side. It doesn't mean there isn't a battle but it does ensure there will be a victory on the other side. Turn to somebody and say, Satan had a plot, but God had a plan. (laughs) Tell somebody, Satan had a plot, but God had a plan. I'm still here. Can I get a witness in the house tonight? Somebody that's been through something. Somebody with a battle scar. Somebody with a story to tell. Somebody with a testimony. It's not been easy, but I'm still here. I am fighting the good fight of faith, and my eyes are still on the prize. Well, hallelujah. (laughs) Global prayer. Satan said, let's stop the prayer meeting. We'll stop everything. Started at the Teal Lowry Ministry Center. Moved from there to a small church. Moved from there to a barn. Moved from the barn to the small hall at OCI. Moved from the small hall at OCI back to where it started, the Teal Lowry Ministry Center, which is now ISO. Made a full circle and guess what? 12 years of praying, and it's still here. 12 years of praying. If you don't believe me, show up on Thursday at 6 o'clock, and we'll show it to you. And not only are we still here, but there are thousands online that join us every single week. Why? Because we did not quit. We did not give up. We kept going, and God saw us through to the end. Well, I told you I felt like preaching, so this is not your style. Hang on. I'll calm down in a minute. But it's like fire shut up in my bones when I think of his goodness and all he's done for me. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, it just makes me want to dance. When I think of his goodness and all he's done, you see, I'm a witness. I saw the devil peek his head and say, I've got you. And I saw the arm of God sweep down and say, oh, no, I had him long before you got here. I have seen the delivering hand of almighty God. And we are witnesses of what God is doing. Hallelujah. Ah, Battle scarred, beat up. Valleys, disappointment. But somebody say, but we're still here. Shout it one more time. We're still here. You see, we got a testimony. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power of God might not be of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, 
but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body of the dying of, of our Lord, the life of Jesus, that it may be manifested in our body. What do these stones mean? They mean we made it. These stones are a testimony that we have seen God's power before and we will see God's power again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, I seldom do anything like this on a personal level because I'm up here to exalt Jesus and not myself. But I had to bring something extremely personal. This is one of the most personal things in my life. I had to bring something. I had to go in the woods today in the rain with an umbrella and get it because it's in my altar in the woods. These are my stones. I was 17 years old when I got called to preach. This is a long story that goes with that that I don't have time to tell. I go up on the top of this mountain. They started calling it Brian's Mountain after a while. I don't know if they call it that now, but that's what they called it then because I was a teenage preacher that would go up there and practice my sermons and they could hear it over in the hollers. They could hear the the, the milk cows mooing and me up on the, on the mountain mooing. And I would go up there every morning because I'm an early riser and I'd go up there every morning and I would climb that mountain and I took my chainsaw and cut down a tree and I'd take my Bible and I'd preach to the squirrels and rabbits and anything that would listen because I, I was a horrible preacher and I knew if I didn't practice, I'd never get anywhere. So I, was, I, just, I didn't really call it preaching, I called it practicing. So I'd go up there and I'd practice my sermon and I'd practice my sermon. The next week I'd go up there and I'd, I'd practice my sermon and, and every week I'd just keep practicing my sermon and then the Lord did a miracle through that and somebody actually got saved that was down in the valley milking their cows. They actually got saved for me preaching up there on that mountain. And when I, when I heard that, this guy came to our church one morning and I was up there playing the bass guitar. I was just minding my own business. I was up there playing the bass behind our little church band and and this guy, this old farmer walked in, down the middle of the aisle. And we all knew him, but he'd never been to church before. Nobody had ever seen him in church. And they said, well, he came and prayed. And, of course, in my little church, they make you testify right away, you know, to see if you really got something. So they, stuffed, they stuck a microphone. And they said, Carol, he said, what in the world caused you to come to church this morning? He said, I can't take it anymore. Every morning I'm milking my cows and I, I hear that same sermon every, one, every morning. It's the same one. I about got the thing memorized now. I can't take it anymore. I just had to come and give my heart to God because I just can't take it anymore. I, I'm standing over there playing the bass and I'm thinking, what? You, that, my, I have a convert. I must really be a preacher. And it, it gave me the confidence to actually go into the pulpit because I was scared to death. And I thought, well, my goodness, I actually have a convert from a sermon. Maybe this is going to work out for me after all. So I go to this place called Brian's Mountain. I would go there every day. And as long as we lived there, I hardly ever missed a day. I even went in the rain. I mean, I'd go in the snow. I had rain gear. It was just my appointment with God. By the way, um, I still keep that appointment with God every day. I don't do it on a mountain, but every day my first appointment is with him, and that happens every day of my life. He gets the first couple hours of my day no matter where I'm at. I have to get up early. If I'm on a plane, wherever I'm at, he's the one that gets the first couple hours of my day, and it's still, that's been 40-some years now, and it's still happening. So I'm about to tell you my age if I'm going to move on now. Perry's five years older than me. Just do the math. So when I was pastor in St. Louis, our church was thriving, thousands of people. We had another campus. I was doing three services every Sunday morning. We had a Wednesday morning service. We were doing eight services on Easter weekend. I mean, it was just a lot going on. And the Lord speaks to me while I'm on vacation with my redhead and says, I'm calling you to leave there and go start a school. And I'll never forget going into the hotel room and my kids were all on staff there. And honestly, the hardest sacrifice we've ever made in our whole life is to be this far from our kids. They live, all of my kids live 500 miles and all five of my grandkids, 500 miles away. That's the, that's the, that's the heaviest cross we bear. And that's just being honest. 
But the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to go build a school. And I think, why not just here? No, I want you to go to a certain place and build a school. I went and told the redhead, and she, she, she started crying. Have you lost your mind? I said, I might have. I don't know. But we got to get God to confirm it. And we, we, we set out a fleece. <laughs> he, he preached on a fleece. <laughs> but we had to get a fleece for this one because it was the biggest decision we'd ever made. And we just basically had 17 questions we wrote down 17 questions that we needed God to answer so that we would know we were in his will. And um, we wrote them down. And then in just a short amount of time, miracle after miracle after miracle started happening. One of the things was Twin Rivers had bought some land. And I didn't want to leave the next pasture with a huge debt because it was over a million dollars. And, and uh, someone wrote us a check for a million dollars to pay that off. In, the, in a two-week period of time after I put this before the Lord, somebody wrote us a check for a million dollars to pay that off. And the Lord said, see, nothing's too hard for me. I said, well, I, I, I got to sell my house, but I've got over 20 real estate agents in my church. I don't want any of them to know. First, they're all going to be mad at me anyway. So I just got to find out how to sell this house. And we were there. Our neighborhood had a yard sale, and we found this this, this flyer that someone had dropped on the ground, and I was just picking up garbage, and I noticed that they had a real estate face, a real estate ad in another county. I'm thinking, oh, they won't know me at all. I just want to find out what my house is worth. I wasn't even going to list it with them. I just wanted them to come and kind of give me an idea of what it was worth because I had to do that. These people walked in my house, and they're in the house 10 minutes, and she starts bawling her eyes out. And I said, oh, my goodness, is, is everything okay? I mean, it was kind of weird, kind of freaky. And I'm thinking, is, is everything okay? He said, you don't understand. She's, she's not upset. She's crying because she wants us to buy this house. I said, what? He said, no. I said, no, you're, you're going to tell me what it's worth. We don't want to tell you what it's worth. We want to buy it. And they bought it. I said, well, they said, well, you tell your realtor how much you want. I don't have a realtor. This is how much I want. And I upped it $50,000 thinking that, you know, than what I thought it was worth. So I just added 50 grand to it. And they said, okay. <laughs> they walked out of my house and my wife looked at me. She said, Brian, what just happened? I said, I, I think I might have sold the house. We haven't even told anybody we're doing any of this yet. I said, I think I just sold the house. It was the craziest ride of our life. One thing after another, just like that happened. And I could just go through this whole thing, telling you story after story after story of things like that that happened. But then I got here, and what I thought was the plan wasn't the plan. So I got here, and I thought the Lord told me to do one thing, so that's what I'm doing. I mean, on the, I'm on the ship, you know, and I'm riding the ship, and, and I'm three months into this journey, and, the, and that plan falls apart. Now I've walked away from my church. I can't go back. I don't even have a key to get in the building, you know. There's a new pastor. So I found myself stuck. Lord, you told me to give up a mega church to come and build you a school and to do ministry here. I did it. And now the plan is, is, up, is upside down. As a matter of fact, it's not just upside down. It's gone. There is no plan. Here I am. And I didn't know what to do. So I did the only thing I knew to do. I got my first preaching Bible, and I went back to the top of that mountain. And I stood on that mountain, and I buried that Bible. And I stood there, and I had a conversation with God that sounded something like this. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't ask to be a preacher. You ask me. I, in the bottom of a wreck, you asked me to preach. I felt like if I didn't say yes, I would die. I... I, I how can I be here now? You have been with me through this and this and this, and I buried this Bible, and the Lord said, now pick up 12 stones. So I looked around, and these are the ones I found. I had a backpack with me where I carried my Bible up, and I filled up these 12 stones, and I got them glued together with super glue, and I built me an altar out in my woods behind my house, and this is where this lays, and this is where this goes, and I go there as often as I can and just pray at this memorial place. But the Lord said, I have been with you all this time. I'm going to be with you now. And can I, can I just fast forward a little bit? I don't have time to tell you the whole story. ISO Bible College now has an accreditation for a bachelor's degree. ISO Bible College has 9,000 students in 77 countries around the world. He is faithful. 
What do these stones mean? God says, if I started it, I'm gonna finish it. It may get rough along the way. You may not understand it. There may be some dips and valleys. There may be some trials. There may be some dark days. But if you do what I told you to do, it's gonna come to pass. Cindy Geshman, it's gonna come to pass. Setbacks are only temporary. It will come to pass. Whatever you're believing God for, it will come to pass because God says, I want a witness that you've seen the goodness of God. So can I stand here and tell you flat-footedly that I've been preaching the gospel now for over 40 years and I can tell you that I have slayed some giants and I love slaying those giants. I'll be honest with you, that's part of the funnest part of what we do. We get to cut the head off the snake and I have slayed some giants and I have come through some valleys and I have been weary and torn and bloody and beat up but I am a witness that my God is faithful that my God is good I am a witness that he can keep you when no one else can keep you he can rescue you when no one else can rescue you I am a witness that God is faithful I've seen his hand and I'm watching his hand work right now he said, identify the witnesses. Here's the second thing. Now, identify the next generation of warriors. Joshua 5 and 5. For all the people who came out had to be circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way they came out of Egypt, they had not been circumcised. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he had raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised in the wilderness. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I've rolled back the reproach from Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of this place shall be Gilgal to this day. So the next thing they had to do is they had to find another generation who would walk in covenant. Now, I don't have time to explain this, but there's a purpose why God chose circumcision. Because he wanted every generation to pass through covenant to be born. So that was the reason for that particular choice on God's and, and, and God's. Uh, idea of what covenant looks like a blood covenant that a child a male child takes and then the seed of that child passes through the covenant of God into the womb and that child has already entered covenant through that matter so what is circumcision in essence it's cutting away flesh it is cutting away things that are in our flesh that were with without getting too literal in this it is a spiritual significance as well of there are some things that cannot go with you. There are some things that cannot that you cannot continue in if you want the goodness of God. You can't have one foot in Saturday night fever and the other foot in Holy Ghost fever. You, you can't do that. You can't be drinking from two bottles. You, you, can't, you can't be drinking from the well of the devil, the spring of the devil, and the well of God at the same time. You can't be speaking one thing with your mouth in, in private and another thing with your mouth in public. God says, I need a generation that is ready to, be, to go up. You gotta be serious about God. And what he was dealing with here is desert babies now what do you mean by desert babies you have to understand it's not that they did anything wrong but these kids had never lived in Egypt they were born in the 40 years of wilderness they were desert babies because they had never they weren't slaves they weren't mad about slavery because they had never been in slavery all they had known is desert life and you know what desert babies looked like these were kids that had always had the pillar of fire in the front yard and the pillar of cloud in the backyard. I mean, you want to see God just go out of the tent. There he is. There's no effort in that. Oh, well, we, we, we know there's the Ark of the Covenant. We can go worship at the temple, and we can keep all the holy feasts because our parents have built all of this, and they're taking me to church. They're giving me all of this, but guess what? I'm a desert baby. I don't know what it's like to be hungry because there's manna every single day. 
Now, it was, the manna did not stop until they crossed the Jordan. That's when the manna stopped. The man, I don't know what it's like to be hungry because every day of my life, I get up and my, my chores around the house is to pick up miracle bread from heaven that fell overnight while I was asleep. And then I can go warm it by the, by the pillar of fire by night. And then I can go get in the cloud by day or I can go see the mercy seat. I can watch the Levites as they're packing up God's house and I've lived this way. I've seen the glory, but I don't know what it takes to bring the glory. I've seen the power of God, but I don't know what it's like to bring the power of God. All I know is that someone else paid a price. And so this is what a lot of people do. They get stuck in religion, thinking religion is just this ride to heaven. And here's the whole problem with desert babies. They understand the prize, but they do not understand the price. Let me say that again. The problem with desert babies is they get the prize. They understand the prize, but they do not understand the price. And the Lord said, you want to be in the glory without fighting the battle. You want someone else to go on the 21-day fast while you play games, and then you want to go into the worship service when they lay hands upon you and fall out in the spirit when you did nothing. You didn't fast one day, and, and you, did, you were playing on video games while everyone else was pushing back their plate and praying in the altars and you're wanting to have a free ride you're hitchhiking your way into the glory because I need a generation that understands how to handle holy things I need a generation that understands what sacred looks like again I need a generation that is that is has a bit of the fear of the Lord inside of them I need a generation I know that you've seen the glory, but what you have not seen is the all-night prayer meeting that brought that glory. What you didn't see is Wayne Guillory praying in the barn all night long so that the fire could fall on a Tuesday night. What you didn't see is that hundreds of people gathering at global prayer week after week after week after week and noon prayer when a handful would show up and they would still pray for an hour. They did it today. There'll be a group doing it on Thursday at ISO. There'll be a, there'll be a global prayer and there's some people, and I'm not fussing at anybody, there's some people who have never done it once. They've never done it once. All they have to do is get up out of their seat and say, feed me, feed me, give me, give me. All they have to do is say, boy, that was a good word tonight. Can't wait to hear next week. How about the word you're eating on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? How about your Bible? Show me, show me the wear and tear. Show me the diet you're on spiritually with the Lord because it takes more than getting up for another freebie and saying, I don't pray at all, but somebody who does lay hands on me. I don't fast at all, but I need somebody who fasts to get this demon out of me. I, I, I don't give at all, but I need somebody who does give to pronounce a blessing over me because I'm not a tither. I'm not a giver. I don't pay any price, but I want the prize. And the Lord says that there's people that can't, that in order for us to go where God is taking us, the Lord says, I need to identify who is willing to take up sword. I need to identify who is willing to pay the price, who's willing to serve, who's willing to pray, who's really, who's willing to worship. I need a warrior that can worship until the glory comes down. I need a warrior who can pray until the answer comes. I need a warrior who can fast until every demon is scared of your street number. You need to fast till the demons take another road because they don't want to go by your house because they're afraid. I am so tired of hearing people testify for the devil. I'm just tired of it, folks. I'm not saying any of you are guilty, but the devil did this and the devil did that and I saw this and I saw that. Come on. Will you stop testifying for the devil and quit running from him. He needs to be running from you. 
Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The last time I read, it was under his feet and he put them under your feet. Why don't you just take your own authority and get the oil, get out the Western oil, put a cross on the front door, say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to crank up my worship music. I'm going to get on my knees in prayer and I'm going to dare the devil to come through my neighborhood because I'm not going to, I'm not worried about what demons is going to jump off of you on me. You better worry about what's in me getting on you because the last I read the Bible, it wasn't the demons jumping on the children of God. Dagon is the one who fell. You bring the Ark of the Covenant in the presence of Dagon. God cut Dagon's head off. He cut his hands off. They propped him back up and God laid him out on the floor. That's the God you serve. You don't have to hide in a corner afraid of the devil. Yes, I know there is is warfare. That's why we have a sword. Yes, I'm not blind in death. I know there's a warfare. That is why we fast. That is why we pray. That is why we march. That is why we sing. You want to have a little less warfare in your house? Then learn to dance. You may dance like a wounded water buffalo, and you might not want anybody to see you, but get in your bedroom and say, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Walk in that son's bedroom who is addicted to gaming and cusses you out on the weekends and has got his liquor hidden under his mattress. Walk in that person's room and say, God, I cast out every demon in this room. I pray, God, you'll take his sleep from him, his food from him. I stand upon the word of God and the power of God. You have the power in the name of Jesus to take your rightful authority. So God is saying, I need a generation. I'm going to tell you, one of the reasons I'm so full of hope is because I saw this generation this weekend. I saw kids pray till midnight. I saw kids in five-hour worship services wanting more. They couldn't wait for more. They wanted the, the glory of God and the power of God, and they saw the glory of God. God says, I need another generation who will seek me, another generation with a prayer life, another generation that will dance and believe I, I'm, I need a generation. It's, it's more. Listen, I, I know we want to be relevant, and I know we want to reach every generation, but there's got to be more to this Holy Ghost party than smoke and lights. There's got to be more than just a new song and a talented musician and a preacher in sneakers telling good jokes. There's got to be more than that. There's got to be more than predictable services and churches that straddle the line between the sacred and the secular. There's got to be more than churches just doing doing things to get more likes on social media. There's got to be more than preachers who are interested in more than a selfie. There's got to be more than that at some point in time. Somebody has got to go to the Amalekites and say, we've come to destroy you. You've haunted my family long enough. Moabites, you're going down. Jebusites, no more. Canaanites, we're getting rid of you. God said, we can have the land and we're going to take what God has promised us. God is looking for a, a no-nonsense worshiper. Guys, think about, I want you to think about this. The next time you pray, count how many times you, you, you use the word me. The next time you pray, get you a piece of paper and count how many times you use the word me in your prayer. God says, I'm tired of you telling me how to fix your life and telling me what you think I need to do. I'm ready for you to do my will. I'm ready for somebody that says, not my will, but thine be done. I'm ready for somebody that says, God, I don't know how to fix my life, so tell me what you want me to do today. When's the last time you got up on a Saturday and you said, Lord, is there anybody you want me to talk to today? Is there anybody you want me to meet today? Is there anybody you want me to share the good news with today? When's the last time you got up and said, Lord, 
uh, my prayer life is just too much talking. I'm going to listen today. I, I think praying is me as a one-sided conversation. It's me begging you for more instead of me begging you for anything. You have you know my needs before I ask. I'm going to sit in your presence. I'm going to sing songs with my hands in the air. I'm going to read the Word of God, and I'm going to let you lead me and guide me into the place where you want me to go. God is saying, I want some lambs to become lions. I want some lambs to become lions. I want you to put up this logo. There's a reason why God has called us back to this logo. It's more than a picture. It is more, it is a sacred gift because when the Lord birthed this, there was purpose behind it. There was reason behind it because at some point in time, show me there's only one battle in the whole Bible where a lamb fights. Lambs do not fight battles. They are not a warring animal. But show me when a lion fights. Show me how a lion fights. A lamb will just feed and be led and eat. But notice this, a lamb is a child. A lamb is not a full-grown sheep. A lamb is a baby sheep. But notice that there are no babies. The Bible doesn't mention a baby lion. A baby lion is not called a lamb. A baby lion is called a what? He's not talking about cubs. He's talking about lambs, babies, and lions, warriors. And the Lord is saying, I need some lambs to take up sword. I need some lambs to pray in, praise in what I'm about to do. This is where lambs become lions. A, a lamb is a, play, is a child who is still growing, but, a, but a, a, a lion is actually a warring animal. Lions are, 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 are fighting off their enemies. Lions are charging at full speed ahead. Lions are rushing into battle. Lions want to enter. You don't want to, you don't want to enter a lion's territory. Has anybody been to Africa on a safari? I've been to Africa on a safari, and they'll tell you when we get into the lion's pride, you don't want to get out of this Jeep. You stay where you are because no one, every time you walk into a lion's pride, they take it as a personal challenge. When are we going to have some people of God that will say, you picked on the wrong house. You came to the wrong teenager. You picked on the wrong child. I'm not having it. I'm not going to put up with it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If I have to kill every devil in Bradley County, I'm coming after you because you're not coming. You're not going to scare my house. I'm coming after you because the one who's with me is greater than the one who's with you. Where are the lions. Where are the lions? Yes, it's good to eat. That's what lambs do. It's good to be led by still waters and let him restore your soul in the past. Yes, that's what lambs do. It's good to have a good shepherd who's fighting the wolves so you don't have to. That's what lambs do. But who's going to win the battle? Who's going to fight the fight? There is a great generation that is dying off one at a time. General after general after general is dropping. Prayer warrior after prayer warrior after prayer warrior is going home to be with heaven. Who's taking up the sword? Who's taking up the mantle? We have to replace them with new warriors. And God is calling a generation of lambs to become lions. Hallelujah. There's a video I want you to watch here real quick because it, it, it actually has to do with us and it's kind of a very unique video. How many of you remember Lance Wallnow, who came and spoke at Prophetic Summit? As a matter of fact, he's coming this time as well. Lance it was in the back room with Perry and I and in the green room and started telling Perry a story that none of us could believe. And so when we, we went to the dinner table that night, we filmed a little bit of the story, and I want you to hear just this part of it. So let's look to the screens. Greetings, everyone. We were in the green room with Lance Wall now, and he began to share a dream that Dutch Sheets had years ago. And you got to remember, this is not recent. I want him to just simply tell you what God told him, first of all, about Chattanooga and what Dutch prophesied over Chattanooga in a dream. But all of you folks from OCI, Pay attention because if you have discernment, you're going to hear something here. 
and it all makes sense. It all makes sense. So I have a business partner who works with me called Mercedes Sparks. Mercedes and Larry Sparks are a great couple. He works as one of the key publishers for Destiny Image. He lands a lot of the contracts. So they're working with me, and uh, she's a Florida girl. And she goes, I really feel like we need to move from Dallas to Florida. And I said, well, you seek the Lord about where. Maybe you'll go. Maybe I'll go. We can be remote. She comes back and says, I can't believe, man, the Lord just gave me a word. The word is Chattanooga. I had to look it up. I wasn't even sure where it was. The Lord said, he didn't answer where we're moving. He said, you want to know where the revival's going, Chattanooga, Tennessee. So she's looking it up. I go, Chattanooga? I mean, it totally took me off guard. I go, it's not even on my mental map. So I go look it up. And next thing you know, I'm at a meeting with Dutch. And Dutch gets up and says, uh, had a you know one of his key uh, people he works with has a dream and he said this is a God dream He said the Lord something to do with Kenneth Cope at Eagle Mountain and there's there's a lot to it But here's the part that I came into the Perry day say, you know, it's weird two o'clock in the morning I'm watching this video of Dutch sheets dream I heard him say it but Chattanooga's in it because Mercedes and Larry send it to me he said Chattanooga's in Dutch's dream. I go again Chattanooga so Dutch says that uh, in his dream, the Lord is giving him a word that he's got to hurry up expeditiously. He's got to move quickly to get to Chattanooga. Because in Chattanooga, there's a crisis. And the crisis is there's a whole flock of sheep wow. that have the heads of lions and the bodies of sheep. And they are stuck in a transition. They need to be raised up as an army of lions, but they can't get on their feet. And they're in there and they're and they're they're caught. And and this he said that this began in November a year ago, which would have been around the election cycle. That was when this this process started to go off. And so Dutch shows up there at Chattanooga. And he said, the first thing that he knows is the Lord tells him, get them on their feet. And he yells, on your feet. And the sheep get up on their feet. And there's this, you mentioned the guy too. There's some preacher out here. Ron Phillips. Who's a Baptist guy, embraces the gospel. He said, and somehow he's like, in the dream, he's an apostolic veterinarian. He said, whoever heard of such a thing? And he comes up and puts his hands on on, uh, on, on the sheep and what's happening is that the Lord says you've got to get the oil on the sheep or they're stuck in a transition and the timing for America is critical. They've got to get through from the lion. The, the sheep have to become lions. So they grab this oil the Lord gives them and they blow and the wind of the spirit takes it starts to coat this, lion, this army of now standing up fragile sheep with lion heads and as the wind blows, it reveals ticks that are all over under the fur of the sheep. And so they're looking at that, but the oil of the anointing gets on them and the ticks begin to fall off and the, the, and the transition accelerates from lion heads to lion bodies. Now the sheep have completely transferred. Bob Phillips is out there saying, wait a second, the lionesses are giving birth. And boom, right, they're giving birth to sheep that become lions rapidly. So we're seeing a movement of the body of Christ going from being sheep to being lions and the transition is happening. And then the word is you've got to hurry up and get to Eagle Mountain somehow. It's like word of faith. Kenneth Copeland has a, has a, has part, is part of the camp that is receiving this and they had to get to Eagle Mountain with Kenneth. And Kenneth has these planes, these jets, and he's starting to load up the, um, the, uh, the, the lions on, and so that the movement is multiplying rapidly. And so I'm just, I brought it up to Perry and I said, why is Chattanooga the place where the sheep are caught in transition to become lions? And they have the heads of lions, the body of sheep, and they're stuck in transition and they have to get the ticks off them so they can complete. It. And there's an urgency about the window of timing. And he's walking around slapping people and like going Pentecostal. I'm going, what's he doing? He's going, did you hear that? Did you hear that? I'm going, and, what is Perry doing? And then I showed you a huge uh, replica of a, lion, a lamb laying beside of lions. And at one time, those were all over this building. I had one made in Israel that's on my desk. And he did not know, nor Dutch knew, that the theme of Omega Center 10 years ago was the place where lambs become lions. Yeah. 
So I tell him this, and I talk about the prophecy given over Cleveland, 1959 in June at Faith Memorial, by a great man who was used of the gifts, that the angel Lord came to him and said the hub of the end time revival would be here in Cleveland, and this, this area would be the hub of what was God, God was going to do in the end time. Start playing, guys. The hub of the end time revival right here. When lambs become lions, and it goes from there to other places, can you see the divine moment that God is inviting us into? Not just another gathering, not just another people. God assigned this to us years ago. God gave us this assignment. No one else in this area, and, I'm not, and God's going to use all the churches, all the pastors, so it's not a competition thing. The Holy Spirit, aren't you glad the Holy Spirit doesn't compete with himself? So it's not about who gets what. It's about assignment. And years ago, the Lord said that, I thought it was interesting that last year when they filmed this, Perry said, this symbol used to be all over this building. Well, guess what? It's all over this building again. <laughs> this is the time to release it. The Lord said, God's getting you ready for what he has ready for you. And what he is calling us into is he, we have to identify two groups. Who are the witnesses who has already seen what God can do? I, I'm gonna do something a little different tonight, and I know that I, I, I talked to our prayer team earlier, and typically, I wanna, I wanna just tell you something that we're fierce about here. We, we just don't let everybody lay hands on anybody because we're just, we want, to be, we want people to be vetted. We want, them to, we want them to go through, you know, our training programs. And we're just very, very intentional about that. But tonight, I'm going to break that rule just a little bit. And, and I know that there might be one that gets through the gate on me. So don't email me. I know that's a possibility. We'll have to deal with it if it happens. Okay. But I need some mothers and fathers. I need to come and act like you do because, because God's the one that's calling for this, not me, really. But if you have a prayer life and you are an intercessor and you're one that has seen what God can do, you know what these 12 stones mean. I was there when the miracle happened. I want some of you to come and stand with me real quick. I just as many of you as I can get, and I'm switching this up from what I told you guys earlier, but I want you to come and stand at the front. I need some fathers and mothers just come and stand in the front. This doesn't mean that you've got to be a certain age. That means that you're a witness of the miracles. You've seen the miracles. And this doesn't mean that you have, that you have parent, that you have children, natural children. It's not about that. It's about witnesses of the miracles. Just come and stand all across the front. Come and stand all across the front. Just keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. All right, now because the Lord said there's going to be two witnesses, if you're standing there, I want you to look to somebody and say, you're my partner tonight. So this, we're going to do this in twos. All right, so find a partner. Find somebody to say, you're my partner. If you need to move, if you don't like your partner, find a different one. But you need to move. There we go. That's how you do it, right there. All right. So there's two people in each group. The Lord said, I want two witnesses in the 12 stones. And I see some of the team coming up from Awaken. You're, you guys are always welcome to join with your partner that you prayed with. I want you to stand all over the room. This is what I feel like the Lord wants us to do tonight. And I'm going to kind of demonstrate this a little bit. And hear, hear my heart. The Lord said to that younger generation, you, you've been in the wilderness where someone else is paying the price, and I'm not, there's people in this room that have paid the price. I get that. But the Lord says, in order for you to go into where we're going to the next season, you have to be anointed. The same thing that happened in this dream. I wish you could have heard the, the full part of that because they, he has a horn of oil. I actually have a horn of oil that's in my office at ISO, that it's a, it's a highly important symbol to me. But I'd never heard anybody say it this way. He said he took the horn and blew into it, and the oil came out through the horn. Like a musical instrument, the oil came out, and that's what went into the sheep. So here's what I want tonight. I want as many people in this room that would say, Dr. B, I want to be in that army. Now, I'm not saying that you're desert babies. That's not why you're coming. You're just saying, I'm signing up. I'm not afraid to fight. I need some people tonight 
I have to identify two groups of people, the Lord said. The group of people who've witnessed the miracles and the group of people that said, I'm going all the way. You can count on me. I will worship. I will pray. I will stay in the fight. So as they begin to sing, and, and I want to say this too, guys. Some of you that's in this line, because we have a big, long line up here. Some of you that's in this line, you might want to go in for prayer. So I want to give you permission to do that. I want you to follow the Holy Spirit. Some of you might want to come out of the line and go to a spiritual father and mother who's going to lay hands upon you, especially all the young people. So I know that our Awaken team is up there, but I'm going to, as, as Pastor B tonight, I'm going to say, I want everyone in Awaken, especially everyone in Awaken tonight, I want you guys to get prayed for. I, I want you to pray for everyone else, but I want you to go to another spiritual father and mother. You guys pass the oil down right now. Everybody, you got to have some oil tonight. This is what we're doing. We're we are anointing warriors. We are anointing a group of people that's going to stand up and fight all across this room. Wow. Look at this. Look at these witnesses. Can you give God a prayer? Look at how many witnesses. I didn't expect to get nearly this many. This is amazing. Now I want to ask you another question. How many of you are in for the long haul? How many of you are ready for the fight? How many are, are ready to be in the army of God and see the glory come? How many of you believe like I believe that we will be a part of the end time revival? We'll be a hub. Maybe not the only hub, but we will be a hub that hosts the glory of God. Then all over this room as they begin to sing, I'm going to ask you to step out and come forward for your anointing as a warrior. All you're doing is stepping forward and being anointed as a warrior. So begin to come right now. Come in and sing, guys. I want you to come and get anointed as a warrior. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be in the fight. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If you want to kneel in front of them or if you want them to stand in front of them, either way, I just want you to be anointed all over this room. Yes, Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. God, we're showing up, Lord. We're showing up, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
just want to be obedient. I hear the Lord saying right now that some of you are entering into new seasons and you need a fresh anointing. So even if you're in this line, this is your moment to step out of the line. Let someone lay hands upon you. So let's just pray for one another. Yeah, if, if there's no one beside of you, just turn to somebody else or go to someone for prayer. But get a fresh anointing for a new season. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. Wow.